Well, good morning to the Living Church. I want to add my greeting to you and uh, my hopes for you to have a joyful Christmas. We know that some of you are visiting from other cities around us, from out state, maybe from lesser states than Minnesota. We want to welcome you uh, to this time. It's a festive time of year, and we hope you're enjoying your families. We always center what we're saying around the Word of God, and that's what we do this morning. So if you're able to stand, will you stand with me in honor of God's Word? As we turn to John chapter 1, starting in verse 9, some very familiar verses. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And some 50 years later, the same author, the Apostle John, writes in 1 John in his letter, starting in verse 1 of chapter 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and testify to it, and proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, as we are about to approach things that we can scarcely understand, we're humbled before the Lord of glory, the maker of heaven and earth, the judge of all men and women. And we thank you that you will meet us here and speak to us. So walk us out of the corridors of our distractions and the trivialities that take up our time and walk us right into the throne of grace where we hear a word from you. Whatever we've brought with us today, whatever troubles we have, whatever joys we bring, speak a living word, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it was 1862 when James Chadwick, a bishop in Northeast England, wanted to write a song for Christmas, and he wanted to put to music the words of the angels that first said this when they saw the baby Jesus, Gloria in excelsis Deo. All the angels spoke Latin in those days. So he, it's, it's like he must have had a tune in his head. He had a melody that he wanted to put in there, but he, he didn't have enough words to fit the melody. So he took one syllable, one vowel, and he elongated it out, and he, he overworked this vowel. He manipulated this vowel, and you know what it is. Glow, oh, 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 Gloria. 16 times. Here's what a musical historian says about that. He says, the O is fluidly sustained through 16 notes of rising and falling melismatic, melodic sequence. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Sounds to me like he said, let's just vamp on this, on this syllable until it catches up with the music. But anyway, don't lose the glory in the O, all right? Don't lose what he was trying to say, because we're talking about a huge concept here. Glory, Gloria. We've 
Talked about a lot of things in this series on the songs we sing. Pastor Tony started with Emmanuel. We've talked about hope and peace and now glory. Another huge word with huge freight behind it. Glory, Gloria. But we talk about it and we sing about it. It's all around in the Bible. But what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, glory is one of those things that you know it when you see it. You know it when you feel it. You know it when you hear it. And we long for it. We are hungry for it. We watch for it. If you were watching Monday Night Football last week, you saw Drew Brees, my favorite quarterback, who had a chance to set the new NFL record for touchdown passes, and he was one short to tie it, so he tied it early in the game, and then he, he threw another pass. It was caught in the end zone. It was the, the record for the NFL for the most touchdown passes, and it was a home game in New Orleans, which is the loudest stadium in the NFL, and the place erupted, and he chest bumped everybody, and high-fived everybody, kept the ball, ran it over to the sidelines, and then the referee said, whoops, we're calling it back that play on a penalty. (laughs) So the glory just all faded away, but he got it later in the game. But, you know, just those little blips, we live for those. We, We want those. We want to be around that. We want to celebrate that. That's why we seek glory. We seek sharper pixels with which to see it. We want to deaden all the other noise so we can hear it more purely. We want to drive faster vehicles, have bigger accomplishments, have higher praise. There's a quest for more, 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 and it's all this glory that we're seeking in ourselves, for ourselves, and for somebody else. We want to hang around it. We are glory-seeking magnets, and so we travel to see it, we spend money to get it, We watch and we watch and we watch trying to participate in it. But what is glory? Well, the New Testament word for it, the Greek word, is doxa. So when you sing the doxology, what you're literally singing is a word of glory. But here's a street-level definition of what glory is. Doxa is the invisible made visible. In other words, it's the unseen going public. It's the infinite worth of God being brought down into some kind of spendable currency that we can use. It's the unreachable made accessible to us. And glory in the scripture is a huge concept. It's both the beginning and the end of everything because all of God's zeal, his purpose, his character is to bring glory to himself. And all of God's goal, his end, is that at the end, everything made and every human being ever born will spend eternity bringing glory to God. And we will never exhaust the exaltation that we bring to him. It's a big concept. And so everything about the birth of the Messiah is punctuated with glory. The angels, the shepherds, the magi, the prophecies that are fulfilled because God is making the invisible extremely visible. So everything about this birth is about His glory. So how do we understand this? Well, there's three ways that I want to point out today. We, We see His glory through splendor. We feel His glory through its weight. And we experience that glory by its attraction to us. So let's, let's camp on those. Let's, let's unpack that. First of all, the splendor of his glory. We know glory when we see it. We know it as radiance or majesty or light or fire. There's something luminous about the glory of God. We often see it in scripture that's portrayed that way. So glory is basically Power going public. In in my generation, some of you will understand this, it's like God letting it all hang out. It's saying, I'm going to show you now what's been invisible up until now. I want to show you my attributes, and we know those attributes. Whenever we see even a tinge of them, we see them as glory. So let's just look at the splendor of his glory in his power. It's 
Behold the splendor of his glory expressed in beauty. Be amazed at the splendor of his glory in his intricate design. Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. God is making himself known in the splendor of his glory, the luminous nature of who he is. He's making the unseen seeable. You remember the encounter that Isaiah had in the temple of God when the temple was quaking and everything was thundering and the angels were singing and they were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his, you would think they would say holiness, but it's full of his glory, full of his glory. Glory is splendor, it is magnificence, it is an unashamed parade of God on display. It's beauty magnified. It's the opulence of his excellencies broadcast to the watching world. It's his infinite worth stunning me to worship. What a contrast, what a far cry this is from our cultural concept of who God is. Our cultural concept is so bleached and flattened, so incurious, so domesticated. Somebody has put a term to it, a multisyllabic definition. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. This is kind of the, the, uh, the software that's running in the culture on the back screen of how people tend to think about God, especially the latest generations in our culture. There are five basic qualities of this View Number one, that God does exist. That's the deism part. He wants people to be good and nice and move to Minnesota. You know? So he's, he's moralistic. Third, his goal for us is our happiness and self-esteem. That's his therapeutic nature. God is not needed, number four, except for big problems. And number five, all good people go to heaven because they deserve it. This is not about the majesty that buckles your knees. This is not about the presence of splendor that makes your your flesh go with goosebumps and your palms to sweat and your heart to beat faster. The living God is not a moralist who came to give us tips and techniques on how we can make our life happy. The revelation of the God of glory will take your breath away or you're spiritually blind and you don't perceive him as he really is. This view of God, this moralistic, therapeutic deism sees God as non-demanding, he's distant, he's just a cosmic therapist. But the God of the universe is the God to be contended with. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 23, it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling man. To have glorious power means that God is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. He can do anything he wants within his nature. And so what is the significance of this glory at the birth of Jesus Christ? Well, listen to what Colossians 1.16 says about this. For by him all things were created. The angels recognized and glorified Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, as the agent of creation, the author of all that is, 
of every cell of your body, every thought in your mind, every synapse in your brain. He is the agent of all creation, it says, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. As the song asks, Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. When the Lord God Almighty pours out a thimble full of his glory. When he walks by and we just see the mere hem of his garment, when he touches us lightly with one of his fingers, how do we respond? The universal response in Scripture is to fall down in silence. Sometimes to just point, to listen, to bask, to wonder, to be miniaturized. That's the splendor of his glory. There's a second way to recognize and define this glory, and that is by the weight of his glory. You know, his glory is not just a laser light show, not just a big parade of all of his impressive attributes, but God has weight. He has gravity. When we encounter the glory of God, there are seismic rumblings that are going on. Remember, in Scripture, it talks about the foundations of the temple were shaking. The lintels were about to fall down. The world is, is quaking. There's a sobering fearfulness and at the same time a longing about the weight of God's glory. It resonates at the deepest levels of our fears and our longings. Glory is felt as the Lord's honor, His repute, His wealth, His impressiveness, His heaviness. The Old Testament word, the Hebrew word is kabod. It just sounds heavy. So glory in this sense is the essential separated from the trivial. When we feel the weight of the glory of God, suddenly we recognize there are substantial things that I need to pay attention to and there's a whole bunch of fluffy, trivial stuff over here that I need to get rid of. We see His glory in creation, but we feel His glory in the law, in the written word in his justice, in his providence, in his judgment, because he separates truth from falsehood. He separates fact from myth. He separates up from down. He separates weightiness from fluffiness when we see and hear and feel the glory of God. Because the law reveals a flawless God, the character of God, we are stunned at our obliviousness. We're crushed by our cavalier transgressions. We're arrested in our sin because God's mirror of glory shows us our imperfection. So to stand under the glory of God is not to ride into the throne room on a skateboard it isn't to show up to a coronation when you're in your flip-flops. It isn't to stand next to God and say, How, how's, how's it going? No, to sense this weight of God's glory is to tremble with the prospect of His infinite authority. It's to shudder at the power He holds over my life and my future. 
It's to quake over what he knows about my heart and my motives and my actions and all of my history. It's to stand in utter reverence as his truth cuts through the tinsel activities and the frivolous priorities that I've often pursued in my life. And it's to say like Isaiah, woe is me. How do I align my life with the gravity of the nature of God. When we sense His glory, our knees buckle, our palms sweat, our skin goes into goosebumps, and we are speechless. So what is the significance of this display of glory at the birth of Jesus? Well, the very first thing, Luke chapter 2, verse 9, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. That fear is reverence. It's that quaking sense, like Isaiah felt, Lord, here am I. Send me. What do you require of me? How can I be of service to you? Most high, they were filled with great fear because the glory as of the only Son of the Father was displaying Himself in this manger. And there was always a gravitas, a gravity to Jesus' life, not only at His birth. He wasn't a a glowing, pulsating baby. It It was God revealing His glory. But throughout His life, He had a sense of of authority. Remember, He spoke, and, and they said, He spoke as one having authority, and people believed what he had to say. So if glory is displayed in his splendor and his omnipotence, glory is weighed by his omniscience, that he knows everything, that he knows everything all at once. He knows everything about me. He sees the hidden. He pierces the mysterious It's God's attention concentrated everywhere at all times on every person so that everything in all creation fulfills the purpose for which it was created. This is God's omniscience. So God is never not there. He's never unseeing. He's never uncaring. He's never uninvolved in our lives. The weight of His glory impresses itself Onto us, so we feel it, but it's not just reverence and fear and quaking, it's also rejoicing. Because when you place yourself humbly under this kind of glory, there's a tremendous sense of I belong and I have something worth praising, I have something worth rejoicing and celebrating because I feel secure, I feel grounded, I feel assured that I am believing and putting my trust in the one and only thing that will stabilize my life and that will always be true. Because you see, Jesus was a glory designed in heaven that came to earth to complete his work. Don't we all rejoice when something that's designed somewhere in a, you know, by, by a, a draftsman or some, by some engineer, when something's designed somewhere in theory and it actually gets the job done on earth? It actually works. You know, when my 10-inch Freud table saw blade cuts through two and a half inch thick oak flawlessly without burning, there's glory in the shop. Because something designed actually works. When I walk through the back door and I smell bread baking from the oven, there's glory in the marriage <laughs> for that. When, when we use a knife, this really overpriced knife that we bought from some struggling college student way back then, just did it as a favor to him. But when we use it, It still cuts bread perfectly. It works. There's glory in something designed by somebody, and it works in our kitchen. When the laptop performs as it should, there's glory in the office. When your teenager shovels the driveway, there's glory (laughs) in the parents. When something designed in theory works in practice, that's glory. 
And this is exactly what Jesus came to do because his glory was expressed. All of God's glory, all of his design was brought to actually do the work that God designed for him to do on earth. And so there's rejoicing when we see his work being done in us and through us. And also there is tremendous rest. When we recognize that the truth that we believe that God has shown us and revealed to us, when we realize that the truth of Jesus as a real person who came to earth, when we believe in him and we see that giving us peace in our heart, when we see it renewing our marriage, when we receive the counsel of the Lord that revolutionizes our fears or gives us guidance for our vocation or brings a prodigal back home, when we see this wisdom and God's omniscience working, we not only rejoice, but we rest in Him. When you are stationed under the sovereign of the universe and He has received you into His family because you believe in His Son, you have rest that cannot be disturbed. I don't know why I keep giving you sleep aids, but here's another one. It's a weighted blanket. Many, many people are buying weighted blankets. They weigh, you know, 12 to 15 pounds. Here's what they say of a weighted blanket. A weighted blanket provides a comforting embrace that can calm anxiety and soothe your senses allowing you to get the rest that you need. The glory of God is expressed in the weight of his word for you. The heaviness becomes an embrace for those who receive it. And here's what it says in Colossians 1.17. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. In him, Roger holds together. Instead of this fragmented, fractured, frazzled life that's spinning off its axis, the weight of the glory of God draws us back to Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life Wrap yourself in this. Designed in heaven, and it works on earth. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save your sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child you've delivered will soon deliver you. We see God's glory in his splendor. We feel it in his weight. But we experience it in the attraction of his glory. We just want to be around glory. We want to be around the shine. We want to be around the accomplishment. We want to be a part of the rejoicing to give glory. And when we give glory to God, when we shout and boast in God, we're not giving him something he didn't already have. We're saying it for our benefit so that we can bask in it. And so his glory is synonymous with rejoicing, boasting, participating. This is glory up close and personal. And we call this presence. It's his presence. We're constantly drawn to it. And it says in John 1.14, the two components of glory that fill him up are grace and and truth. We're constantly invited into this to experience this kind of glory. The scripture talks about his personal presence and invites us to taste, to come, to drink, to take shelter, to watch, to pour out your heart, to seek, to not, to knock. And when we do that, he says, I will give you complete, undivided attention. I will be with you. The glory of Jesus, the glory of God, is the attraction of his grace and truth, that glory came near and dwelt among us. So Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to the blind man? 
Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. In the incarnation, we see something impossibly glorious. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. From eternity to here. From the infinite to time and space. God has put himself fully in the birth of his son. I have a a very favorite meal. My wife is here, so she's hearing this. I have a birthday coming up. It's a port wine, pork tenderloin meal. So Joanne has to put on a wig and dark glasses and go to a liquor store (laughs) in another state and buy some port wine. And, and she puts it in a pan on low, under, up by, under low heat, and, and she, she reduces it down to about 50%, so it boils all the Lutheran stuff out of it. <laughs> all the Presbyterian, it's perfectly a Baptist brew after that. It's all reduced. And then she adds an equal amount of cream, heavy cream, and she reduces that to where it's, you know, all total. It's, it's less than half of the total that's been put into that pan, and it makes the most caramelized glory you will ever taste. (laughs) This is a sauce to die for because all of the essence of those tastes has been concentrated in this sauce. Now, I know this is a kind of a mouth-watering and trivial kind of illustration, but I want you to just take it from there. That God in all of his glory has concentrated the essence of who he is. The impossibility of putting his glory into an eight pound baby that has human DNA, born of a virgin but conceived by the Holy Spirit, all of the essence of God's glory is put into this human being, full, it says, full of grace and truth. His glory is concentrated in it, born in a humble stable, in his lowliness and humility, so that he can identify with me and with you. He can meet me on my street. He can find you in your kitchen. He can find you at your school, in your struggles. He can find me in my confusion And John goes to great pains in 1 John chapter 1 to say, this is the one we have touched. We didn't just touch him. We handled him. We heard him. We saw him. This is the Lord of glory walking among us. And he is not only present, he is omnipresent. Always present. He's not only imminent or transcendent out there, he's imminent right here. And so glory is the perfect revelation of grace and truth. And it came in the form of a baby born in Bethlehem's manger, endlessly attractive to draw us to grace Endlessly satisfying to show us the truth when we're confused. We're endlessly amazed at what we find when we look at his revealed word and discover him again and again and again. And when the Holy Spirit prompts us to come back to him when we've wandered and we say, yes, you are still full of grace and truth. This is the attraction of glory. We've been opening Christmas cards. We let them pile up and 
We spent some time opening them recently. And we saw testimonies of the glory of God in the grace and truth of Christ. We saw cards from couples whose marriages have been rescued this year by the grace of Jesus. We read cards from people who have been utterly crushed with life-changing loss this year, but because of the glory of Christ in their life, they are taking another step into obedience. We saw testimonies how God has provided fresh hope, how he's brought home a prodigal son, how he's lavished resources that were unheard of, unthought of, unimaginable, how his grace has spilled out into countless ministries all over the world. The glory of Jesus Christ is not only in the attractiveness of him, but it's in the attractiveness of his living church that looks something like him and practices something like his fullness of grace and truth. And this is the glory of God in the living church of Jesus Christ. To experience the splendor and the weight and the attraction of his glory. And the best part is that our whole journey with Jesus will redound to the praise of his glory. And we will spend countless eons of time unable to exhaust the praise of his glory because it is so vast and immeasurable. When you receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you trust him, it says in John 1.12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. Not only to enjoy his glory forever, but to experience it here today in the rough and tumble of our present life. If you don't know him, we invite you to receive him. And we are here every day and every hour of the year to share with you the good news that he's come in his glory for you. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you this day for your revelation of yourself, which we would not have known had you not spoken it. So, Lord Jesus, help us to stand humbly before you and receive your glory, to be renewed by it, to be silenced by it, to find you again in the the busyness of the season. And Lord, we pray that anyone here who needs to come to know you will be drawn by that irresistible picture of glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.